So as I said, uh, we're diving into uh, the first module for this course. Uh, this module will include several particular lectures which will uh, remind you uh, about uh, key features of mechanistic modeling of dynamic systems. Um, these lectures are relevant for all the types of dynamic modeling that we will be using and seeing and all the types that you will have been exposed to previously, very likely. And I would most notably uh, feature within these lectures um, aggregate models, so differential equation-based models on the one hand, um, uh, and uh, in models that are uh, articulated at individual level, agent-based models also. It does, it does also apply for discrete event simulation models. And what I'm going to try to, to do within these couple lectures is hit on a number of ways of looking at these systems and understanding them, which will be foundational in terms of reasoning about them uh, more generally, but will also lay the groundwork for approaching some of the data science or system data science concepts um, a few lectures down further. Okay? And uh, specifically in dealing with these mechanistic models, we are dealing with models of, of systems out there in the world that uh, will be informing our understanding of many sources of data concerning those systems in those later lectures, and which are competent to ask questions about counterfactual situations, um, and hence are of increasing interest in this rapidly growing area of causal AI. Okay? Um, they're not the only game in town in, in terms of that, but in terms of providing explanation, explanatory value, and helping us reason about counterfactuals and helping us fill in the dots for, uh, for data and reason about underlying processes, these techniques will all be very important. And I'm going to be introducing four different ways of understanding the system and weaving them together, many of which, well, all of which we're going to be returning to repeatedly throughout the course. Okay. So these four different ways involve kind of four different lenses for these systems. And they come in pairs. They're sort of two pairs of eyes, okay, um, as it were. The first pair of eyes has to do with the structure of the system, okay. So these are sort of a structural uh, lens on the, on the system, okay. And um, here we're going to be looking at uh, a higher level, what I'll call declarative uh, characterization. Um, and the sort of exemplar for this that I'm going to return repeatedly to, even in today's lecture, but in many later lectures, um, so this is characterization, and um, is, is uh, stock and flow models, okay? Um, uh, everyone in this room will be familiar with the fact that um, we have an emerging language in different spheres of agent-based modeling for articulating uh, what an agent-based model um, assumes in, in terms of dynamic structure. Um, what, are, what are some key building blocks we use in agent-based side when delineating structure in a declarative way? I, by declarative, I mean we're or emphasizing um, the what of the system rather than getting into all the details of exactly how we solve things. Um, what, what's something that allows us to specify the structure of a system in an agent-based model? Anyone? A sort of preeminent building block that we use a lot is, begins with an S? States. States and state charts, yeah. Um, stock and flow models, you know, when we characterize them, with stocks and flows, we're characterizing the state of the system, we're characterizing the rules by which it evolves, um, the actions that change the state and, and how much those actions take place uh, with, with rules involving the values of the flows. And we have some analogs in, in, in age-based modeling that are comparatively primitive by comparison, but we'll, we'll come back to later. They're not as fulsome a language yet. Um, and we've done some work in our group and with uh, Chris Duchin, amongst other things, and articulating other languages for that. So this is declarative characterization in form of stock and flow models. Um, and in fact, this next one, 
we could say is declarative also, but it's um, sort of a, a lower level specification, one that compiles out, as it were, it collapses down a lot of the human understanding that's present in stock and flow models. It, it eliminates certain intermediate structures uh, that you might use to reason about the system and, and, and give you sort of an understanding at a, at a conceptual level what's going on and instead reduces it to ordinary differential equations. Okay? Um, these are two different depictions of the structure of the system. So these are structural depictions. Okay? Um, and these structural depictions, while mathematically identical um, in terms of their behavioral implications, have different sorts of information captured. Um, and uh, there are some things arguably capturable with ODEs that aren't uh, cleanly represented in stock and flow models, um, uh, visual depiction, but stock and flow models capture visually at a level of abstraction that's very useful for us reasoning about. And they, they do so in a way that, that helps us see the forest um, rather than purely the trees, as we sometimes get stuck with ODEs. For example, ODEs will have lots of repeated terms um, associated with them. Um, for example, if we have a stock X and a flow from X to Y, um, the sort of the equate or the formulas associated with the flow will will appear twice: once in X and then again in Y where in Y they'll be positive and X they'll be negative because it's flowing out of X and it's flowing into Y. So ODEs specify something that mathematically sort of produces the same behavior as stock and flow models, but they do so in a way that's more low level, that repeats elements, so it's, it's less kind of a natural level of, of abstract description at, at some level. Um, there's abstractions not captured in ODE models, but more than this, um, they eliminate uh, human-related um, constructs, um, like, you know, something like uh, we might have here a prevalence of infection or something. You know, what fraction of the population is infected, and it's, you know, y divided by x plus y where X and Y are sort of counts of people. We might have a prevalence in our stock and flow model that then shapes the probability a given, infect, a given susceptible will get infected. But that's compiled out, as it were, in the ODE. This appears, but it appears as a formula in the lowest level components. So we'll come back to this, and we'll be seeing ways in which uh, those relate to one another. If you have an ODE, you can't always reconstruct uniquely a uh, uh, you know, a stock and flow model. It's a, it's a non-invertible mapping from a stock and flow model to an ODE because uh, you're not going to be able to reconstruct all these intermediate quantities. Um, and both provide useful uh, perspectives, as we'll see. Uh, particularly tapping into, as David Spivak says at MIT, the human visual cortex for, for stock and flow models. But there's two other, there's another pair beyond you know, the structural depictions, we have behavioral depictions. Behavioral. Um, and uh, these behavioral depictions um, uh, use uh, different mechanisms for characterizing the mathematical implications, implications of the structural models. In system dynamics, one of the sort of um, old chestnuts that's passed around is structure determines behavior. So given structure, it entails certain behavior, produces behavior, okay? And, um, and uh, these uh, stock, whether it's a stock and flow model or ODEs, the mathematical implications in terms of behavior will be, will map to the, to the same behavior. And, one of them is going to be very familiar with you, very, most familiar, and these are sort of over time graphs, okay? So here, time, the time context is foremost. We capture the behavior of the system, you know, as it varies over time, maybe with respect to not one, but multiple 
uh, variables shown, you know, um, in elements. And we capture sort of the context. Um, a, you know, if we go left and right, we're, we're dealing with different points in time, right? Um, uh, by contrast, the final, the final um, lens here um, that we can use for behavior, so these are, I should really be consistent with colors, um, behavioral depictions uh, is, have to do with uh, state space diagrams or phase space as they're called. Oh, man. I'm, I'm like color impaired. Um, well, that's a, something you may have noticed a long time ago, but um, state space depictions, okay? Um, here we go. Um, so here, we're depicting things in a way where uh, context is depicted in terms of state space, okay? Um, time is implicit uh, here. We, we actually can't tell at what time something necessarily happens, but we can reason about the entire state space of the system. How would it behave at different points? So this is kind of a state space uh, picture. Um, and whereas this one is a, is a time context picture. And these are four different ways of understanding systems. And we'll, we'll see that each of them brings some unique features to the table. Um, the state space picture is really handy for understanding the possible behaviors of the system, not merely those that we've exercised. Um, the time one gives us an understanding of over time in detailed ways. How does it uh, play out? Um, and the structural methods help us understand the structure of a system. Now, when it comes to understanding data, later, you know, in, in another couple lectures, um, all these lenses will be useful, um, and we'll be returning to them repeatedly. This time context and state context will be two different ways in which we interpret data. We'll take data, and we will view it over time. Um, in ways that might allow us to deduce something about the underlying models or reason about where it's going or estimate the, the state space um, uh, current, uh, currently occupied by the system, the point in state space, um, or the, in the distribution that we might infer. Um, we might ask what if questions. The state space portrait will be useful for reasoning about the underlying drivers uh, of the system and its, its behavior more more generally and identifying things like feedbacks in the system and uh, these two uh, types ways of depicting models will uh, will have their place in terms of understanding what's going on as well so these are four pictures okay four lenses as it were um, none can replace the other and it's really useful to be able to take on different sets of glasses at different times for different purposes okay so I have a set of examples that I'm going to be walking you through. Um, for some, the mathematics will be probably very familiar. For others, it may be more challenging. I would emphasize the value of watching the videos I've suggested to provide you a reminder of those of the the, the mathematical foundations. Okay, I've I've picked out those videos because I think they're useful in giving an intuition. Now, in the process of doing this, um, while we're moving towards the systems data science kind of perspective here, um, I'm also going to try to provide these intuitions on what's going on with these models. Because it's really useful for a practicing dynamic modeler to have this ability to switch between these views and to be able to look at what's going on in one and understand what it means in terms of the other, okay? Um, uh, and I'm going to try to give some of the intuitions. At times, I will be giving intuitions about things that may seem a little bit further afield, but are, in fact, highly relevant. For example, um, how matrices work, sort of the intuitions behind matrices. Matrices as operators geometrically that do things so that we can understand uh, systems that are nonlinear uh, more richly by, um, uh, by reasoning about them sort of around certain points and so on. So I'm gonna be 
building in some additional intuitions. Hopefully you'll get a bit of intuitions about differential equations as well. But we will not have time to do a comprehensive coverage of this. That's, those are whole courses over in math. And, and uh, you will find, for those interested in going into more detail, some of the videos that I provided are part of series, um, particularly those by Gilbert Strang at MIT, which, which do provide a fulsome walkthrough of a lot of, a lot of related um, thinking. And so you can, you, know, you can dive off into those areas in very rich ways. Um, I can only give sketches here because I really want to get to the system data science core methods and approaches uh, as distinguished feature of these classes, uh, of, of this class. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit where we're going. And to get there, I want to introduce a set of exemplar models, a, a set of example models that we'll be walking through where we'll put on each of these lenses. We'll switch lenses for these different examples and see what we get out from each lens. Okay? Mm, that's where we're going. Okay, now, um, to do this, uh, I have prepared a notebook um, which is uh, in a package called Maple. Okay? Um, and some of you uh, may be uh, familiar with Maple. I don't, do, do any of the um, other courses you've worked in use Maple? Maple is a proudly Canadian uh, software product that came out of uh, Waterloo, I believe, many years ago. Um, and it's broadly, um, broadly inter I shouldn't say interchangeable. It broadly fulfills many of overlapping goals with Mathematica. I don't, I don't know if anyone here has used Mathematica, but if you're a practicing dynamic modeler, these are really good packages to at least have a handle on. And to that end, I'm going to provide my Maple notebook to you. So you could then manipulate it. You can call it Maple. U of S has some sort of site license-ish thing for Maple. Okay, I, it, I, I don't think it's universal site license. I think they have like a finite number of Maple licenses, like 100 that can be in use at any one time and there's an authorization server. But if you're interested, I would encourage you to think about trying your hand at it because it's a great package and includes some, some really nice features that can build intuition amongst other things. So um, I went through and I, I um, pulled together a set of examples. Now, as I said, these examples go back and forth with these different lenses, okay? And because it's probably the most familiar one to you, I'm going to be starting with a lens that um, Hopefully, you folks will all find uh, uh, familiar, okay? And that is um, a lens associated with stock and flow modeling, okay? Um, and we're gonna be working uh, up uh, with this example um, in just a moment. But before that, I actually wanna start with an even simpler example, okay? Um, because I want to make sure that people are on the same page with respect to some basics before elaborating to more and more sophisticated models. So I'm going to first start here. This, by the way, this is a software program, Vensim. Have, has anyone here used Vensim? Wade and Bryce, yeah. So Vensim is a, um, is a great package for manipulating differential equations and, and for manipulating system dynamics models in particular. Um, it's a package that I was using back when it first, first came out, and, and I have a weak spot in my heart from it, uh, for it. Um, <laughs> weak spot in my heart from it would sound somewhat adverse, um, and maybe I have that as well. But, um, uh, but it is a package that I think is, is particularly strong when when uh, sort of uh, very easily interacting with these sets of equations, running them quickly, and also for depicting them. It has a lot of a nicer visual presentation than any logic. And uh, rather than trying to squeeze all ourselves into any logic here, I'm going to use Vensim for a lot of this stuff as I, as I am want. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually clean this up slightly. 
Um, so it's even um, a simpler, uh, simpler depiction. And um, I'm going to separate this into two pieces. Um, and uh, we're going to have, in fact, first, I'm going to have a stock X and a flow out of X. Okay, here we are. Stock X and, uh, you know, uh, we'll call it uh, uh, death of X, okay? Um, there we go. Uh, and the formula for death of X, well, who should be able to tell me what this is? If you've, if you've been through um, been through my class uh, before um, for 394, 858, you should be able to tell me if this is a first order delay, what does this formula need to be? If this is the mean time, does anyone remember? It is X divided by the mean time in X. Okay, so I'm just gonna pick this, there we go, boom. Okay, and um, I'll come back to this to this uh, Y, but I guess we'll, we'll just handle it right now. I'm gonna have an initial value here of, uh, that's also non-zero. I think I chose it in my Maple notebook to be uh, an initial value of 400 and 100, okay? So Y is gonna be 100. Here we go, 100, and this can be mean time and Y. Okay. So let's just focus on this guy here. So we have a stock X. You know, I, I feel guilty. This should really be called capital X, okay? Because it's a state variable. And naming conventions are important. In mathematics, we have all sorts of naming conventions, which often you have a hard time looking up. There's, like, there's no reference sheet. I'm planning to add that to my thesis notes and so on. Like, don't use don't use, you know, I to depict a real number. Um, it, it's, 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 it's bad news. Uh, or, you know, when you use alpha, that's, that's a real valued quantity, typically, um, real or complex. Okay, so here we have a stock. All it is is X and an outflow from X. And the outflow, if this is a first order delay, what's the formula for that outflow? If we have a mean time in that stock of mu, What's the value for this outflow? This is a mean time. Give you a hint. X over mu. Sorry? X over mu. Yes, x over mu. It's, it's got to be that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, from dimensional considerations alone, the unit of x is whatever x is. Let's say it's people, right? Mu, it's mean time, so it's time. And... A flow is associated with units of the stock from which it came divided by what? Begins with T, ends with E. It has an I and an M in it. Time, right? If, if you have a stock and you have a flow out of it, the, the value of the flow indicates the number of people, say here, people, going down that flow per unit time, right? That's what flows are. I mean, a, a number, a hundred, means like a hundred, say, people per year. Dying, right? Or something along those lines. Um, so, so the units of the flow have to be the units of a stock divided by time, okay? Or the, the dimensions of it, or dimension of the stock divided by time. So if the stock is people, the flow will be people per unit time. If if the stock is dollars, the flow is dollars per unit time, right? It, it's got to be that way. Um, and, uh, and so if you have a mean time here, the value for the formula here is pretty limited. It can't be, you know, x times mu, because what would be the time, what would be the units, so the, the dimensions associated with this outflow then? If, if the formula for the outflow was x times mu, you would have person times, right? It would be like person years in the, out, uh, the outflow, which would not be a happy thing. We want to flow this, the, unit, the dimension of the stock divided by time. So it has to be divided by this time. It can't be divided by time squared because that wouldn't be the right units either. It would be like people per, you know, year squared, which would be rate of increase of 
people per unit time, which would be, you know, and, and it's not dimensionally consistent. Okay, we'll come back to that in much more detail later in the course. But this is the formula. So if I have that, or equivalently, this goes into a, a, a cloud, which by the way, in Benson looks oddly like Australia without the Cape York Peninsula. Um, uh, so alternatively here, we could phrase this as a first order delay with, instead of a mean time, we have a hazard rate, a chance per unit time, probability per unit time. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the formula for, act, for that outflow now? It's been a long summer, I know. It is, does it involve alpha? Yeah, it's got to involve alpha, ladies and gentlemen. It's got to involve alpha. I mean, if, if alpha is zero, is anyone flowing out? No. So it, it has to involve alpha. Like, if it didn't involve alpha, we wouldn't care if alpha was zero or, you know, you know, um, 200,000, which it can be. It's a hazard rate. It can be greater than one. So it's got to involve alpha. And what else has to it involve? Does it have to involve? It has to involve x. Yeah, because if... If there ain't no one in the stock, ain't no one gonna flow out, eh? Okay, sorry if that rings awkwardly on Canadian ears. Um, sometimes I shift into the vernacular of my country of birth. Um, okay, so, so it's got involved X, right? And the units of a hazard rate are chance per unit time, or the dimensions, chance, a probability per unit time. Probability per unit time. So the dimensions of alpha, I'm going to be coming back to this later in the course, but we write it like this. The dimensions of alpha are equal to, well, it's a probability per unit time. What's the, okay, so, so dimensions of that, well, we know time has got to be in the, in the denominator, call it T, okay? What's in the numerator? Well, it's a probability per unit time. What's the units of a probability? It's unitless. It's unitless. It's right. It's like the fraction of coin flips that turn up heads. It's the probability that it turns up heads, right? So it's like number of times it turned up heads over the total number of times you flipped it, right? It's unitless. It doesn't matter if you count it in thousands of coin flips in not numerator and denominator, or millions of coin flips. If one in the denominator means one million and you know, 0.5 in the numerator means 0.5 million. That's fine. It all cancels out in the end because it's units of coin flips over in the numer in the numerator divided by units uh, by you know units of coin flips in the denominator, right? So it's unitless. So it's we write it as one over t. Okay. So in short, its unit is one over time, one over or per unit time, probability per unit. It's a good way to interpret it. Okay, so knowing that, what does this formula have to be? It has to involve alpha. It has to involve x. And I told you before, the, the dimension of a flow has to be dimension of a stock divided by what? Time. Time. Sorry? Yeah. X times alpha. It's, it's got to be that way. It's, it has to be that way for it to have the right units. And... And, and it's, you know, it, it makes sense because if there's no x's, no one's going to go down here. If there's no alphas, no one's going to go, or, you know, if alpha is zero, it's gonna, no, one, uh, it, it, no one's going to proceed down this, this flow, right? Mm -hmm. You can view that either way. Okay. So that's, that's a little stock and flow model. And just a reminder on the formulas. Have you ever thought that these models we build... These, these models of the structural depictions of the system, they're kind of like a, it's, it's like a, the opposite of a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet hides the formulas, but shows you the, the values. These kind of structural depictions hide the, the, the values, but they show you the formulas of the relationships, what depends on what, right? That's what these arrows are. Uh -huh. Put in another arrow like that. It kind of shows you 
information about the, the relationships but hides the values. So they're kind of like a, a spreadsheet uh, turnaround, but they're very, very useful for looking at this. Um, okay, so this is a, a stock and flow model. Tell me, that's good, that's good. Um, if we were to write this down, just let's let's consider just just say this this one here um, for simplicity with the alpha. Um, you know, if you had a mean time, how could you turn it into a to a hazard rate? How could you if you had a mean time? And I wanted to phrase this as if it were alpha times x. How how could I do that? Well, alpha is just one over. And, and that's, that's a fact about the distributions involved. And it reflects the fact that we have an exponentially distributed resonance time. But alpha is one over mu, or mu is one over alpha. You, they're, they're interchangeable ways of writing the same thing mathematically if you just go between the mean time, which is of units what? Or of dimension what? Time. It's a mean time. It's a time. And you go over alpha, which is one over t. They're just reciprocals of one another. You can write it as, you know, this times 0.01 or this divided by 100, right? It's the same, same thing. The mean time is just 1 over the hazard rate, and the hazard rate is just 1 over the mean time. Okay, so this is, this is good. If we were to write this down as a differential equation, an ordinary differential equation, what would we write down? Anyone feeling brave enough to specify? Speak out, bold use. Okay. Um, it's not exactly a Greek chorus, but did I hear a whisper? Yeah, okay. So, so with an ordinary differential equation, we have a left and we have a right-hand side, right? Now, the left side is a derivative, right? It's derivative per unit time. With an ordinary differential equation, um, it's, it's with respect to one variable. And here, it's always going to be time for dynamic models. It's the dynamic, right? So this is going to be dx dt. The rate of change of x per unit time is equal to what here? It's equal to what? Well, OK, this is saying x dx dt is changing by a certain rate. What's the rate that it's changing by? Well, there's no inflows to it. There's only one outflow. So, so it's got to be changing. Its, its value is changing by how quickly people are leaving. And how quickly people are people leaving? Uh, alpha x, good. OK. And the units match, right? Like the units of dx dt. We're not quite done, but the units of dx dt are what? Well, it's the units of x, or the dimensions of x, divided by the units of time, right? Um, and if I'm just dealing with, with, uh, with dimension, I don't have to worry about whether it's weeks or months or years. Um, I'll just write it over t. It's whatever this is. So this might be persons per unit time, right? That's, that's the dimensions of this guy. This is how fast this is changing, like people per unit time by which it's going up or down, how quickly it's rising or how quickly it's falling, right? Okay, on the right-hand side, do we have something that's in units of x per unit time? Yeah, we do. This alpha is units 1 over t, or dimension 1 over t, excuse me, and x is, is well, it's, that's units or whatever the unit of the units of x is in dimension, whatever the dimension of x is. So this is the right, it's the right dimension, but what's missing? There's something missing here. There's one critical thing missing. It's it's all what? Negative. It's a negative. Why is it a negative? Because it's flowing out. Oh. So the bigger alpha x is, the more quickly x is going down per unit of time, right? So if, if alpha x is 1,000 people per year, you know, dx dt will be minus 1,000 people per year, right? That's our formula. That's our, that's our differential equation formula. 
Well, that's interesting, right? You, you look at that and it packs it all in a really powerful way, um, this structure. I mean, you, you see immediately the details of this formulation and uh, you see it related, you know, in, in a quite mathematically specific thing. Sometimes we'll write this as, sometimes I'll write as x dot, okay? This is going between Leibniz notation and Newton notation. There's a really nasty conflict between the two of them. I don't know if you folks know about it. But it was, it almost led to, it was kind of like the math, it was like the mathematical Brexit of the 17th century or something, <laughs> 18th century. So Leibniz was in Germany and Newton was in, in uh, England. And they, they invented calculus in their own, their own unique ways or their own you know, special ways about the same time. But they got in a silly man fight about it. And, you know, he said, like, I'm the inventor of the calculus. And, and um, it became particularly bad with England because England got this, this haughty attitude towards continental mathematics. And they said, basically, we don't really need the continent. We have Newton and everything is light. Alexander Pope, if you don't recognize the reference. And, and so they ended up kind of separating from a lot of the intellectual currents which were so vibrant in Europe and stagnating to a certain degree, many, many observers argue. Um, unfortunately, they, not total stagnation, but they, they didn't take advantage of a lot of the ideas uh, current in the continent as well as they could have. So this is Leibniz notation, I believe, and this is Newton notation. I'm not going to I don't have a dog in that fight. Um, okay, uh, both were geniuses and you know, invented something of great value or, uh, independently. Okay, so here we go. Um, so this is the rate of change of x, right? And, 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 and so this is just memory. Okay, so this, this equation shows us, shows us everything. What it doesn't do is sort of capture for us immediately the feedbacks visually, right? Like the fact that um, here we have a implied feedback from X on this outflow. And you know, the fact that this is an outflow is just implicit. This is gonna become more, uh, more central later. Um, here, if we look at the stock and flow diagram at an instant, we can see whatever this flow is, kind of abstracts away from what the formula is. But whatever it is, it has to depend on alpha and an x. That's useful. Being able, to, just like in our editors, right? We look to see, like to be able to see the structure of a program without going into all the weeds of the details. Always, you know, see a listing of the methods that this class supports. So it is with um, with the stock and flow diagram. You kind of have uh, the essential dependencies shown without the details of the formulae. Whereas ODE notation shows the formulas, but often will will forget about some of the salient abstractions, like this is a flow between x and y, and turn it into two, you know, just formulas that are in different areas. We'll come back to that point. So this is a differential equation view of that. So I want to ask you, does anyone remember the solution to this? Does anyone remember, you know, if we if we solve this in terms of behavior over time, what does that look like? Anyone? In terms of behavior over time, what does that look like? Mm. Anyone? It's like an exponential. Yeah, yeah. And this is key. Ladies and gentlemen, Exponentials are our friends. Exponentials are my friends. And exponentials should be your friends too. Okay. Exponentials are kind of the natural language for linear time invariant systems. Okay. So this is these are the these are the eigenfunctions of linear time invariant functions. They're kind of the natural building blocks by which we describe behavior for linear systems, okay? Um, and they're natural in part because you feed in an exponential with a given characteristic into a system like this, and you get out that same exponential as output with the, with the same basic features, like the same frequency of it. If 
feed in a thing of a certain frequency and you get out something of that same frequency, just, just bigger or smaller in terms of how, you know, how big the oscillations are. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. There's some, a lot of subtleties I'm glossing over here, but that's the basic idea. They're kind of the natural building blocks of analyzing these things because they are, they are the things that if we pass them through the system are unaffected. And so exponentials will be key. And the formula for this, th the solution to this will be x of t. So x at time t, we're going to have a behavior over time. x at time t is going to be equal to some value of x at time 0, whatever its value was at time 0, times what? Anyone? e to the power minus alpha times t. Why does that have to be the case? So this is t, right? It's saying to get the value of x at a certain point in time, this point in time, um, we just take its initial value times the exponent of minus alpha times t. Okay, so I want to build intuition with this. So first of all, what what is that? So that may look weird. It was just some weird factoid. You know, maybe I could have written hyperbolic tangent of this, or you know, I could have written the gamma function of it, or something. It may not seem obvious, but no, this is this is like the face of beauty staring back at me. Okay, th this is this. This, this has a significant truth because this, this exponential, e to the whatever, that's, that's key because that's kind of the natural language we, uh, we describe these systems, their behavior in terms of. And when it comes to, for linear systems, when it comes to nonlinear systems, they'll play a big role as well in understanding their behaviors, okay? Um, so let's think about this. Let's just talk about it a little bit more. This is not an arbitrary thing. This is a thing of truth and beauty wrapped into one, okay? Okay, so what's the units of, of uh, t? Well, it's whatever the units are of time. We'll talk about dimension, it's dimension time. What's the dimension of alpha, anyone? Remember that? Dimension of alpha is one over t, right? And so this e to the minus alpha t, it's e to the minus, well, and it's dimensions of that exponent, minus alpha times t, its dimensions of alpha is minus, well, okay, it's, it's units of taking the minus of something of the same as the thing itself. So the units are going to be alpha times, the units of alpha times the units of t. The units of alpha are 1 over t, 1 over whatever the dimensions of, of time are, and t, the dimensions of that of t, and so we, we multiply them together, and we get something that is what? Of what dimension? Unit, yeah, it's, 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 we could say dimensionless, but the truth is that's a bad, so you'll hear me say that a lot, a lot. The truth is that's legitimately critiqued. Just like if I say something of length zero is, is, lengthless, you know, we're kind of playing on a weakness of English, right? Because it's not that it's lengthless, it's length of zero. Um, but in English, when we say like it's lengthless, it can be used to mean informally that something's length is zero, right? Um, but it's, it has a length, it's a very particular length, a really special length, zero. And this has a special length, a length that's of profound significance for modeling because it's unitless. And what, regardless of whether you do machine learning, um, models, statistical models, dynamic models, this notion of unitless quantities is central because they are the natural ways to describe the world because the world doesn't care about our units. There's got to be a mode of analyzing the world, describing the world that has no units involved or else the world, its behavior depend on what unit system we choose. And it will allow us to have fewer parameters in some of our analyses, okay? So this is unitless, or 
dimensionless or of unit dimension. And that's the preferred way to say it. It's of unit dimension. It's dimension one, okay? Meaning it doesn't depend on our unit system. Okay? It, it's independent of our unit system. It's fine if we measure time in years and alpha is one over years or time in months and alpha is one over months or time in milliseconds and alpha is time of, mil, uh, of one over milliseconds, chance per, per, per millisecond, okay? Um, great. Um, so, uh, so this is, th that, that makes sense. I want to go into another feature. I know I'm dwelling on this, but this is going to give us power to spread our wings in a little bit. What does this look like dynamically? Like if, if we view things over time from the lens of a, of a, of a time picture, of a time, time lens, what does this look like? Well, initially it's a value at x0. What, what happens after x0? Okay, so it's e to the minus alpha t. Let's assume, I mean, alpha is a chance per unit time, probability per unit time. Probabilities have to be measured, have to be, have to be above zero, right? Um, and time, it doesn't here, it's per unit, unit time and here we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the value of sort of uh, per unit time uh, that also is going to have a, a positive uh, value here so so what does this look like over time as we we take time going from zero to, to increasing time well this is going to be growing the the val the thing in the exponent if we consider it's minus alpha t as time grows, what's going to be going up? T, right? T is going to be rising. Alpha is going to be the same. Okay, so, so it's going to be e to the minus alpha times some growing quantity. So it's going to be, and if alpha is the same, it's constant. It's going to be e to the minus, well, minus some growing quantity, right? Because alpha times t is going to be growing as well, right? And you may remember, you may not have an intuition for what e to the minus something is, but does anyone remember an identity for that? e to the minus alpha t, how is that related to e to the alpha t? Yeah, it's the reciprocal, right? It's 1 over e to the alpha t, right? Right? That's, that's what a minus in the means. You take 1 over it, right? Um, it's like x to the minus 2 is 1 over x squared, right? Um, x to the minus 1 is 1 over x, right? So, so alpha t is growing, and so 1 over e to the alpha t is growing as well, right? And specifically, so as time goes up, it grows. Now, how does it grow? Downward. Sorry? It goes downward. Now, does it go down like that and cross the axis? It levels off. It, it levels off. And, and specifically, I mean, as 1 over e to the alpha t, if we understand e to the minus alpha t is that, e to the alpha t, when t is 0, e to the alpha t is, is e to the 0, which is 1, right? Um, and as t rises, e to the alpha t rises, 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 and it goes towards infinity. So 1 over something that's going towards infinity goes to what? Zero. Zero. Yeah. So over time, it doesn't cross the, the, the y-axis. Instead, it's, it, it's going down, but it's actually going down slower and slower, okay? And we'll switch back lenses here in just a moment to explain that. But it's going to be going down this if you actually plot out an e to the minus alpha t, it's going to be going down slower and slower. Now, what's going on from a stock and flow perspective? Well, look, I mean, the outflow is alpha times x. So as x gets smaller, guess what will get smaller as well? The value of the uh, outflow. Yeah, the value of x will get smaller. So alpha x will get smaller. So it's going to be drained less and less quickly. The number of people. So imagine a hospital chock-a-block full of 1,000 people initially. Um, 
and maybe each one has a probability per day of being discharged, of, or say per hour of one out of 100. As each successive hour goes on, there are fewer and fewer people in the hospital. Let's assume there's no inflows. And so after a couple of days, there'll be fewer and, people, fewer and fewer people there. And if each person's still there, there's a chance of one out of 100 each hour to be discharged. There's going to be fewer and fewer people leaving over time, right? Right? And, and as x approaches 0, the outflow, rate of the outflow will approach what? Zero and approach zero, and so it'll be going, it'll be going down slower and slower. If we think about it from a differential equation standpoint, as x becomes smaller and smaller here, dx dt equals minus alpha times something that's smaller and smaller, and therefore the rate of change of x will be smaller and smaller. So x won't be changing as quickly. It'll still be going down. That's why it's a negative here. It, it's going down, but it's going down slower and slower as x becomes smaller, right? And that's why we see that, okay? This is why we, we, we see this behavior. Um, and uh, this is true, and you know, for its analog here. I said they were mathematically identical. So if we wanted to express this instead in terms of mean time, to how would I have to adapt this? If I wanted to write this in terms of a mean time spent in the stock, what would I write? e to the minus, yeah, so I'll write t over mu. So alpha is 1 over mu, so it's just 1 over, one over mu times t. I, I just wrote a shorthand because I was running out of board space, right? Um, and vice versa, right? It's the same thing. By the way, that, does that check unit-wise? Mu is measured at time dimensions, t is measured in time, so you have one over the other and, and they cancel, right? So, so it's, it works, it works very nicely. Um, so this is, this is good, we, we get this picture of it going down. That's just a reminder of the mathematics. We covered this in 394, 858, but this is gonna be really important. And this E thing is not just some weird thing that appears there. That is sort of the, 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 the natural building block showing up from the get-go, even with this very simple thing. And we'll see that. But I want to talk about one other thing that maybe a, seemed like an odd, an odd factoid that I said, look, this, new, this exponent is dimensionless. Excuse me. It's a unit dimension. Hmm? Okay. Let's talk about that. Mm. Now, I'm tempted to use that board, um, but I don't want to inconvenience students. Um, but this is going to take a little bit of space to write, OK? Um, here we go. Here we go. If I use this area artfully, I think I can do it. Oh, look at that. OK. Can you use the back? Or is that easier? I'm sorry? Oh, oh, that's an interesting idea. You could. Multiply yourself by a, a, a reflection matrix. Okay, you'll know where we're going. Um, okay. Uh, I, uh, so we had a technical discussion group at MIT, and one of the guys was quite into chess, and he uh, he, he said like at one point he was thinking so much about chess that like when when he was in a place he had to go get ice cream uh, by going by kind of going to the front of the room and over to a table, he, he would think like, okay, I need to make a night move. Um, <laughs> you know, to retrieve the, the, the ice cream. Um, you folks can wonder what I think about. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I want to just remember one fact or you probably have forgotten, but it has to do with something called a Taylor series. Do you remember a Taylor series? Okay. Um, you probably did this in your freshman or sophomore year, and you haven't really explored it since, maybe. Um, but I, I'm going to write out the Taylor series for e to the so e to the x. Does anyone remember the Taylor series from e to, for e to the x? It's an awesome Taylor series. This is like the best 
Okay. The, the, yeah, it's tied in my mind. Gilbert Strang has the same has the same aesthetics. This is like tied with with one other. Um, what is e to the x? Does anyone remember the Taylor series? If we write it out, do you remember what a Taylor series is? It expresses something. A Taylor series expresses as as a sum of powers of, so if this is a function of x, it expresses that as a sum of powers of, you know, some, some, some alpha sub i here. So this is from one to what in general? Infinity. Infinity. Um, a sum of some, for each power, there's going to be a, some constant in front, um, times x to the what? i. It's a sum of, of powers, okay? Okay, so e to the x, does anyone remember what that is? It's, we're going to write it out as a sum of things, okay? But, oh, I, there's something wrong with my definition. What is, what, what's wrong with my definition? This is the sum from zero. Zero, zero indeed. There's a constant term in front, in general, okay? So e to the x, does anyone remember what it is? It's, it's, not, it's not the best the best one. Okay? No one, no one remember? No? Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be 1, and I'm going to write this, uh, uh, write this like, like this for a reason, okay? Just to, to indicate. It's going to be x to the 0 over 0 factorial, okay? plus x to the 1 over 1 factorial, plus x to the 2 over 2 factorial, plus x to the what? 3 over 3 factorial, plus da 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 da, and it's, you know, x to the n over n factorial in general, and on and on it goes, right? By the way, have you ever, by the way, so zero factorial, just a factoid, what is the value of this? One. One. And there's a deep reason for that. I'm going to. That may be part of the category theory course. Um, and what is x to the zero? One. So this turns into one. one. We'll sort of cross that and say one. It's just, it is one. Okay? So just simplify your life and think about it as one. Okay? Um, by the way, factorial, do you know factorial? 2 factorial is 2 times 1, right? Um, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, right? Um, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Yeah, okay. Why does it have to be this? Well, does anyone remember? Oh, all these things are all related. Oh, if only you could, if only you could see that. So, what's it? So I told you that, that these exponentials are going to be the building blocks kind of, a, of describing these linear time invariant systems. And there's, there's a reason for that that has to do with their interaction with the differential operator, okay? So what is the derivative? If we take the derivative with respect to x of e to the x, does anyone remember what you get out? Yeah, you get out e to the x, right? It's to this earlier, I said, you feed in something, you get the same thing out. Here, you feed in something to the derivative operator. You take its derivative and you get out the same thing. Okay. Now, why is that? Does that is that true over here? You take. Do you remember how to take the derivative of, of like an x to the i? What's the derivative of x to the i? X to the i minus. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's i times x to the i minus one. Right. So you take the derivative of this. Let's take. Take the derivative of it, right? D to the d to the x divided by um, x. Okay, so it's take the derivative with respect to x of this, um, and what do you get? What happens to the one term? It vanishes. How about x to the one? What does that turn into? One. Yeah, it turns into one times x to the zero over one, right? Um, and that ends up turning turning into. Oh, such wonderful color, thanks to Christine. So I'm going to turn this into what? One. one. It's just one, because x is zero. One. How many ways can you write one? Um, 
right? And x squared, what, what is that going to turn into? If we take the derivative by that, it's going to turn into what? Two, two times x to the, well, 2 minus 1, right? Which is 1, um, divided by 2, right? And what's going to happen? This is going to cancel that 2. And this is x to the 1, right? So what we're going to get out here is x to the 1 over what? 1, or one you could write it as 1 factorial, right? Right? And same thing with 3. Let's, let's, let's just do it for 3. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so we'll do it for 3. 3 times x to the 3 minus 1, right? Over 3 factorial. Guess what cancels? This 3 cancels, right? This guy cancels with that guy. That's uh, x squared. Now, what's remaining in the what's still in the denominator? So the three cancels. Does everything cancel? No. What's still in the denominator? Two. two. Yeah, two factorial. Two factorial. It's our old friend. So this is x squared over. Well, I'll write it in blue. Right. That got to get better. By the end of the term, I'll start getting better. Okay. So x squared over two factorial. Right. Yeah, so that's that. You recognize that? You recognize that? You recognize that? Everything just kind of shifts to the left, right? Like in terms of its impact. So, so yeah, the derivative is equal to blah 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 blah, blah um, which is equal to none other than what? The same thing, right? So you take the derivative, you get the actually the same thing. No. If that's not awesome, I don't know quite what is um, in this world. I mean, it's awesome, OK? Um, OK, now, this is super important, what I've just shown you. You may think that's a, just a weird factoid related to why we feed in these things, we get them out from a linear time invariant system. You feed it in. You feed in something that's an exponential and its derivative on that left-hand side of a differential equation is also e to the x. And the thing on the right-hand side will also be, be something times e to the x, and it will all be beautiful. But this is also of great importance for the dimensional argument I'm making. Why is it that, that, that whatever it's e to the whatever, the x here has to be unitless or, or of unit dimension? Dimensionless. Why is that? What can't you do? What's like breaking a cardinal rule of, of, um, of dimensional quantities? So let me ask you this. Can I, can I um, take a, can I take a, a, a dollar amount and add, so, so suppose I have something measured in dollars and I want to add something else measured in dollars. Can I do that? Add together dollars with dollars? Yeah, person with persons, right? 100 person plus 200 person is 300 person, right? That's meaningful. Can I take, okay, now no, no, let's think about it. Can I take persons and, and ask about like um, person years live by multiplying it by years? So I get person years. Turns out I can, okay? Or I can ask about persons times something of, of unit one over time, like, like we did over here, right? Um, so this is persons divided by time. I can get something of persons per unit time, right? That's fine. Or here, um, persons times alpha, which is of dimension what? One over time. I can, I can divide things that are of different dimensions and get something that's sort of a compound dimension. I can multiply things of different dimensions, right? And get something of compound dimension. Sometimes the dimensions actually cancel in nice ways, but, but I can do that, that's perfectly legitimate. Can I add things of different dimensions? Could I add dollars to persons? No, that would be, that would be weird, right? You get like a, a person, something that's half person, half dollar. <laughs> Pretty weird, wouldn't it? Um, it's like Bill Gates or something like that, right? Um, okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, yeah, I, 
can think of another political figure, but I won't go into it. <laughs> um, so uh, slouching toward Bethlehem to be born, um, if you know the poetry of, of Yeats. Um, okay, so um, so e to the x uh, is is equal to this. So, and what what does that tell me? If I can't add together um, something of of different dimensions, what does that tell me? All these things like this first term and e to the x, the second term x to one to the one to the divided by the one factorial is x squared divided by two factorial. Those have to be, can they be different dimension? No, they have to be the same dimension. And the only dimension, ladies and gentlemen, just like the only number, which when you take it to, you know, if I consider a constant, to the ith power, right? Um, uh, the only number, only natural number, where I take that to the i's power and I get back c is is what? Yes, yeah. and I said natural number, so one. It's a unit dimension, okay? Unit dimension. So I I thing of unit dimension, thing of whose dimension, if we have c equal one, the, the dimension of c is one, meaning it's it's dimensionless. It's unit. It, 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 it doesn't have any particular dimensions, like a probability. You can take the dimension of c to the n, and the dimension of c to the n is, anyone want to guess? So it is 1 as well. It is 1 as well. It's actually the dimension of c to the n. I think I heard that as well. It is the dimension of c to the n, and the dimension of c is 1, so then 1 to the n is just 1. So, so these different things here can only be the unit dimension. They can only be the unit dimension. So the thing in the exponent has to have unit dimension. If, if it had dimension, let's say, of time, let's suppose you had you know, e to the minus time, that wouldn't make any sense. You'd be adding a time to a time squared, to a time cubed, to a time time to the fourth, or imagine it was measured in meters. You'd be adding something in linear meters, meters to the one power, to something in meters squared, like a square meters, to something meters cubed. It doesn't make sense to add two quantities, right? Like that. It's like adding square meters to a meter. What, what does that mean? One's a unit of area, one's a unit of linear length. It, it does make sense, it, it, you know, semantically, um, to add a, to to add you know uh, one meter to three meters squared. It, it, it doesn't make sense. You have to you can add areas, or you can add linear lengths, but you can't add a linear length to an area. So what I'm saying is these things to make sense, given that this is a sum, these things have to be dimensionless quantities. Okay, so it. Whatever you have in an exponential to be sort of dimensionally proper, it needs to be it needs to be unitless, dimensionless, or of unit dimension. I prefer. Okay, and and that's why it has to have something like alpha times t, or t divided by mu, in a way that these dimensions cancel. Right? Alpha is of unit one over two, uh, dimension one over t. T is of dimension T, so multiplying them will be dimension one, and you, you get get all these things. And, and we could put the minus signs in there, and it'll be fun. It's the same basic deal. Okay? Um, so ladies and gentlemen, that's why this, whatever you have in an exponent, it has to be dimensionless. By the way, the same thing is true for for things like sine function, you feed into a sine function or cosine. Those have to be Unitless things inside of those because it's a power series. Okay. Um, okay. So here we have a depiction over time associated with a single stock. Okay. Um, this I drew it out right there. Right. Great. That was for a single stock. Hmm? So suppose we have two stocks. Two stocks. X and Y. And to be consistent, this should be capitalized here. There we go. So 
What, so x, how is it going to vary over time? We're looking at a stock and flow lens right now. How does that vary over time? It's, it, it's going to be going down as x0 times e to the minus what? Alpha, which is 1 over mean time in x, right? Times time, right? And this is the, this is mu, this is mean time. That's why its unit is dimension, is, is time. It's, its dimension is time. So this is mean time, right? Um, and there you have x over mu, and the equivalent is this guy here. Um, x0 times e to the t minus mu. And, and y, it's going to be the same thing, right? It's the same structure, right? Uh -huh. That makes sense? So, I mean, if we were to look at this uh, over time here in Vensum, right, um, we, can, uh, we can go do and do a synthesim here. It's kind of a nice feature of, of Vensum. Maybe what we'll do is we'll set this. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave this. I'll set this to be a final time of, let's say, 10. Okay, fine. Um, there we go. And, you know, as we vary this, we'll see it decrease faster or, or, or slower, right? Um, and the basic deal is that um, both of them decrease as e to the minus alpha t with different alphas. Uh, this guy here, uh, their alpha, if I, if I go back and, and reset this, there, this one's alpha is 1 over 2, right? Um, alpha is just mu is 1 over alpha, or alpha is 1 over mu. You can write them interchangeable here. So it's just mathematically identical. Um, equals 1 over alpha, or alpha equally much so is 1 over mu. You could just do the, the algebra. Um, and they're both basically just this, right? So, so this one will go down as e to the minus t over 1. And this one will go down as e to the minus t over 2. And as we change the assumptions about these constants, it so will drag it out or, or not, right? OK. Now, I want to introduce the key structure for this coming lecture, OK? Having put in place this basic foundation and some introductory remarks. So what we're going to do now is move beyond single variable models to systems of of elements because ladies and gentlemen the world is a tangled place it's not only got lots of moving parts they're coupled together in complex words they're tangled together and so what goes on in one place influences the other so you know uh if we have hairs and links right what goes on the hairs influences the link population what goes on the links population influences the hairs right and so it is with all the systems we're dealing with. And when we collect data about these systems, that's reflected in our data and in profound ways. These are data about often a common underlying system whose dynamics we're trying to understand. And we have measurements of different parts of it, but they all whisper about the system, um, the whole system that's driving them. So, so here, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to be going from a stock in isolation to a system of equations. And so we're going to be using a vector notation. And um, this might take a little bit of getting used to for some of you, but, um, but it's compact enough I can actually squeeze it into this uh, area of the board. Okay? So we're going to be writing, instead of just x as a single state variable, we're going to be writing x as a vector, okay? Um, and instead of having dx dt as a single number, a, a single value, rate of change of a single variable, we're going to write um, um, x, x hat, or their x uh, arrow. This is indicating it's a vector. I put the arrow over to indicate it's a, you know, it's a, it's a set of things. Maybe it's in our old thing, it's x and y, right? Um, or maybe it's x, y, and z also, right? Okay, so we're gonna have that on the left-hand side. And in general, it's going to equal 
some function of what on the right hand side? In these systems that are tangled, these systems we describe mechanistically, the behavior of the system at any one time depends on its own what? Yeah, its own state, the state of the system, the current situation throughout the system. So it's gonna be it's gonna be something like this. It's rate of change of all the different pieces of the system are gonna be given by some vector-based function of the different pieces of the system. I'm gonna unpack this for this this element we just have there on the board where we only have two stocks, right? Just so you could see this if I could. Okay. Okay. Oh, and I, maybe I should write that like that. Yeah? So now x vector will be, for example, x and y? Correct. Yeah, so, so, soon. But, but uh, I used the term x there, so maybe I should have called the vector v. If I had been more artful, I'll call it v, which is like the state vector. Or maybe I call it s for state. How's that? I think that, that might be better, right? And maybe that includes, for example, x and y. So let's unpack that, OK? So it might be something like here. Oh, I have a here. I have a, I have a uh, so this will well what we're gonna say S. We're gonna we're gonna have an S here that's X and Y, like that, like that thing on the board, right? Uh, on the on the screen. And so S dot is going to be X Y, that's just S, right? Um, dot, the rate of change of that, which I'm going to write as, just make it clear, x dot and y dot, the rate of change of x and y, how quickly they're going up and down. In other words, dx, dy. I'll, I'll, I'll put that in there just to make sure everyone is rowing in the same direction, right? dx, dt equals dy, dt. It's one of the last times I'll, I'll do that, maybe the last, okay? Okay, I hope no one minds if I eat into our state space. Okay? okay? This thing is going to equal some function. This is a vector-based function as I've written it there. S arrow dot equals F arrow of S arrow. Um, it, maybe it's, it, it seems a, a bit rich. I'll write it here as, OK, so dx dt equals some g, some function g of of s, and what is s right now? Well, it's, it's x and y, right? Um, so we, we could informally just write it g of, of x comma y, or we could write it as, as, as g of the, this is some, this is no longer a vector value function, it's just, this is a number now. It's a, a function of the state, it's gonna get back a number at any one time, X is going to be rising at a certain rate, 10 people per day, or dropping at a certain rate. You know, it's going has a rate of change of minus 5 people per day or something, right? And here, we're going to have H, uh, X, and Y. Just like that. There we go. So, so um, what this is saying is um, we're going to be, at any given time, the, the rate of change of, of, of X per unit time is going to be given by some function g of the state, and the rate of change of y at any given time is going to be some function h of the, the state, right? And, and and for this thing right on the board, that that depiction there, and I'll be letting you go in just a moment. Um, what what is g and what is h? Anyone? What is what is g here? Well, in, in this case. What is what is G? Yeah, so so that's right. So I'll just write it this way. This is a this is a vector, right? The left hand side is a vector, a vector of rates of change, right? So it, it's got to be equal to right hand side vector here, right? There's a vector on the right hand side, and G here is just minus minus alpha over mean time in x, which I'll call mu sub x, okay? Mean time in x, mu sub x, and I'll call mean time in y as uh, mu sub y. Mean uh, time in x and mean time in, in y, okay? Yeah, 
Um, so this is just going to be, you know, x over mu sub x, right? That's what that is, right? This, uh, mm -hmm. this. Remember that? Remember it's it's this guy. It's x divided by that, and it's it's flowing out. So there's a minus sign, right? And this is y over what? Mu y. So it's the mean time in y. That's all I'm doing is sort of transcribing this into its equivalent here through this basic um, thing where we had this before we showed first order delay where we had a mean time mu. Okay? And th that's all that is. Okay? That's, that's what that function is. The, this function g here is just this guy. This function h is that guy. And I could write it in terms of the vector, like this is the first element of the vector and that's the second element of that vector. But for simplicity, I just put it down as, as x and y. Right? I could have written s sub 1 and s sub 2 over that, right, if I, if I wanted to. Yeah. If you like that, it can be s sub 1 over mu sub x, meaning the first subscript of this vector, um, this vector s over here. But because we have dx, dt, I just I did it that way. Okay. Um, so this is a concrete example of this form for the example we've shown. But here, we have a decoupled system. This, this guy, g, that's determining the value of dx dt, it doesn't depend on what? Y. On y. And the value for y doesn't depend on x, right? So they're decoupled. I, I talked about coupling, but, but here they're decoupled. You know, I, I could vary. Watch this. Watch this. I can move this around. Does, it, does x get affected at all? Maybe my head is blocking it. Um, but x doesn't get affected at all, right? They're decoupled. But next time we're going to dive into the case where they're highly coupled with this foundation. And it turns out that for linear systems, for a broad class of linear systems that we're going to be focusing on, recognizing their subtleties and other, um, other spheres, for a broad class of linear systems, you're going to be able to take a system which is coupled nominally, where x depends on y and one depends on x, but in a linear way. We'll talk about that. And you're going to be able to sort of do a, um, a choice of new variables involving x and y, an artful choice of of variables, instead of doing x and y, we'll analyze it in terms of w and z. And by doing that, they'll be decoupled. They'll be entirely decoupled. We'll be able to take a system that's tangled in a linear way and decouple it. And basically turn it into a system that's decoupled in a linear way. And then analyze it. And, and that, that will be elegant and beautiful, and this formula will come up again. This exact formula that bestrides the board right there. Okay? This will come up again with matrices. Instead of x being a, a number, it's going to be a matrix. Okay? And uh, it's going to allow us to, to separate these linear systems. And that will end up influencing this. It'll end up influencing its behavior in state space. But in the fullness of time, we will go from systems that are linear, this is another example of it, very nice, nice sort of structure, linear in a, a straightforward way and, and with um, some straightforward characteristics. And we'll go to systems that are also linear, but involve some, some more complex features in their dynamic behavior, in, in this case uh, associated with a um, with, with a um, imaginary, uh, what are called eigen, eigenvalues, okay? And then we're gonna get into nonlinear systems and we will see how they change things and going from two dimensions to three dimensions uh, and nominal state space, we'll see how, how nonlinearity ends up affecting things. Because fundamentally for nonlinear systems, we can't decouple them in this nice way, except around certain points for short periods of time and analysis, we can analyze it, particularly things called critical points or fixed points, which are where it's imbalanced. 
So we're going to be accelerating through that um, next time. And we're going to see how this basic theory that we explicated here, including this e to the x that's the solution over here, it all plays out for linear systems beautifully, even if they're coupled. Because coupled linear systems, we can still take apart into pieces, understand the pieces, and understand the whole. Where that breaks down is in nonlinear systems. And, but people sometimes say, talking about nonlinear systems is talking about, like, talking about non-elephant animals, because the vast majority of systems out there are nonlinear. And it's almost as if some people feel that talk about linearity, it's like we somehow weirdly understand the world of animals by asking, are they elephants or non-elephants? You know, and describing all things that aren't elephants as, as non-elephants. It's actually not like that at all, in my view. It's, it's linear systems will describe nonlinear systems in certain very circumscribed circumstances. And we can still understand a lot about a nonlinear system by understanding its behavior literally around a certain point, like it's the point where it's uh, at rest, for example, um, or for short periods of time. And uh, this will end up playing a big role in our system data science techniques, including the Kalman filter, okay? where we fundamentally are linearizing around points in state space to reason about things. And then we'll go on to tools like particle filtering and particle MCMC, which don't have a need to do that, in which secure extra power and are subject to less risk. Because with nonlinear um, state space portraits, we can get more and more off by thinking we're in the wrong, the wrong basin of attraction. So that's where we're going. And I will share this uh, maple sheet with you. And uh, if any of you are interested, you could follow through my examples as we go through them in class and maybe interact uh, with them as I will do so. So um, for next time, um, we'll be going on to this case of coupled systems. We'll talk about a little bit about diagonalizing matrices associated with this. And we'll see how all this applies even to coupled linear systems in a beautiful way in a way that allows our friend, the exponentials, once again, the, the, the primacy of position in terms of understanding behavior. Um, what seems coupled, we can turn non-coupled, but we'll be flummoxed in our abilities in that sphere with nonlinear systems, okay? Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's next time. I will um, probably send out a suggestion for a particular priority videos um, for uh, next time in light of where we're at at this sphere um, that will put you in good stead for the very next lecture, okay? Thanks very much.